Hi, and welcome back to the Wall Street Wildlife podcast. Uh, we released a couple of bonus episodes in the last couple of days, and one of them was about Bitcoin, and we got a bunch of interesting questions on the back of that. So we thought we'd go down the rabbit hole a little bit deeper. Very interesting news in this space just last night. I've woken up this morning to learn that uh, the SEC have now approved Bitcoin ETFs. That's confirmed. And apparently they're straight out of the gate. There are 11 approved ETFs that I believe you can buy today um, that are trading Bitcoin. So, Christoph, why is this important? Bitcoin is an alternative to the world's global monetary system, basically. And for the most part, as a technology, Bitcoin was hard. It was hard for most people. I mean, you kind of had to be on the bleeding edge to, to know where to buy it. And then there was a whole bunch of fraud, fraudulent activity with the crypto exchanges. And even people that were interested in owning it didn't really have, you know, you kind of had, had to have a lot of fortitude and technological know-how to, to carry it out. Uh, now that it's become a regulated and approved asset class, all financial advisors will need to offer it, essentially. And if you now want to own Bitcoin, you basically can, with much of the friction removed. So it opens the floodgates, I think, to Bitcoin being available pretty much to anyone and everyone that wants it. So that's a huge, huge deal. I think the better follow-up question is, why would you want Bitcoin? So why would you want Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> How short can I make this? The problem, as I see it, is that money we know is a story and the fiat system, uh, which I believe means by, uh, by dictate, meaning a nation state could simply make more of its currency. So when a government or a country can just make as much of its own currency as it wants, over time we've learned that it does exactly that. And the really kind of dark view about all this is that if we want to finance a war, sure, let's do that. And we're going to just print more money and then suffer the consequences later. So a lot of people who are philosophically interested in Bitcoin are interested in it because it provides an alternative to the let's make as much money as we want system. So... People who, I mean, we're now living in inflationary times, right? Which for many people is hard because everything costs more, but your salaries are not matching the rate of inflation. So you could feel it. The purchasing power of a dollar is now less than ever. So one way of thinking of that is that behind the curtain, so to speak, your government doesn't have to be the U.S. government, all governments around the world are making more of their money, which means your own money, the money that you have and saved is worth less. So you are being essentially taxed without your permission, right? No one's consulting you about how much money, right, your government ought to print. And so along came this technology uh, in 2008 called Bitcoin. And the basic feature, the most important feature of it, honestly, is that it is capped at a maximum amount that's called it being you know it's it's solving them the hard money problem you can't inflate it therefore it ends up the value and price of it ends up being entirely dependent on supply and demand and market forces if enough people believe in it as an asset class then it will essentially uh in a self-fulfilling prophecy be worth what people believe it to be worth in the context of supply and demand, right? And so to, I guess, answer this, this main question, why is today such a big deal? Well, now Bitcoin becomes an asset class that has proven itself in the first, I guess, uh, now 15 years of its existence in the technological sense. And now it's open and available to most people. I totally get the benefit of being able to buy Bitcoin through an ETF. Because if you wanted to own cryptocurrency in the past, you either had to rely on, you actually own the coins, 
you had to rely on exchange to hold them for you. And then, you know, exchanges were getting hacked all the time, or you had to do self custody, hold the coins yourself. And then, you know, at, at the dumbest, you might lose your key. And so you've lost your currency, but you might also get hacked or compromised yourself. So it was, you had all these risks that weren't to do with the fundamentals of Bitcoin, just the kind of logistics of managing it that now go away if you just buy a Bitcoin ETF. So yeah, I get that that's a, uh, a seminal moment. Yeah, and uh, right, it's huge. It's it's absolutely huge. But I think the consequences that follow from this are even bigger that are going to play out for the next many years. And you know, from our recent conversations that my bearish, my first time being a legitimate bear in my investing career mainly rides on the data linked to how much debt that not only the United States is under, but essentially all of Europe and Japan, and I would call the most advanced nations in the world, but especially the United States. So in my world, in my understanding, I guess, of finance and economics, you can't get something for nothing and expect there to be no consequences. So when money is literally printed at a rate uh, that is higher than ever, and the debt amount is now higher than ever and rising more quickly than ever, we as citizens have felt this directly because of the inflationary effects it has. But what I'm saying now is there is no solution that, as far as I could tell, to the immense amounts of debt that we've printed because the debt now has to be financed via interest rates. So the only options now, as far as I could tell, are severe austerity measures, which in these doomsday scenarios mean collapses of banks, especially region, small regional banks, right? That the government says like, oops, we're fucked. So something's got to give. And therefore that's one route. Or we're going to go back to printing more money, which will only accelerate the inflation and the, the interest rates continuing to go up, leading to some of these, you know, cataclysmic economic collapses that countries like Venezuela, Argentina, and Greece, and so on and so forth have felt. Let me, let me pose a, a challenging question. I've got no idea, uh, even if this question makes sense. But um, so I think well, you're implying like some perhaps far or medium term future where stuff is priced in Bitcoin, you know, you buy your McDonald's for X Satoshis. Um, otherwise you still have like this dollar Bitcoin rate and you can still have kind of your, um, your paper money. So let's look at what happened in the Euro project, uh, in Europe. And you had some countries like Greece and Spain that were suddenly had no monetary, no fiscal policy control. Like they were part of the euro and they weren't able to manage their own economy. And that was disastrous for them in some cases. So I don't know if the euro project has succeeded or failed, but certainly there were consequences of losing direct control of your fiscal policy. So if countries move on to Bitcoin as their standard, does that not put them in the same position? They suddenly can't control their interest rates and they might end up in a hyperinflation scenario and, and it's out of their control to rein it in. I, that is not how I think of Bitcoin. I'm not thinking of it as a currency replacement. I'm thinking of it as a better form of gold. And, you know, there's massive debates about all of this, but there's a lot to be said for why gold was the anchor for monetary policy because if it goes back to what i was just saying if you violate basic economic principle of uh, constraint then money becomes devalued debased and that's what gold did it basically said you could only make as much of your dollars as you have gold in your stores so you have to make hard decisions right you can't just go off fighting wars because you feel like it because you can't finance them. You don't have enough gold, right? Bitcoin is essentially gold that is made technological slash digital and also more accessible. I mean, it improves on gold in all the ways. 
it allows you to transport it more quickly, access it via the internet, all of, all of that. So I, w I don't see it as replacing global currencies. I see it as an asset class that says what it does, which is stores value better than anything else. But also it does get more complicated because people are, because it's a technology, people are building additional layers on top of it. So something like the Lightning Network will allow people to buy things using Bitcoin. But I don't, I think that's a perk. That's a huge perk. But to me, that's like a second order of operations. How does it really change anything though? So say we go from uh, like the dollar with gold still underpinning it in some way, although these things are disconnected, we can print more money, as you say. If we move from that world to a world where it's the dollar and we're printing it and there's Bitcoin underpinning it, it hasn't changed our ability to print money to have like rampant inflation. And I'd argue the disconnecting from the gold standard, I think there are many benefits of that. It's like it's allowed society to accelerate in the developed world much more rapidly than if you were limited by um, this fixed asset. So how, do, how is Bitcoin really changing things? You know, the truth, I guess, is always somewhere in the middle, right? I believe what you're referring to is the great cross of gold speech, speeches that were made in this debate about do we get off the gold standard or not? And as usual, the way I, I see things is that it's not a binary outcome. Leaving, uh, weaning ourselves off the gold standard allowed for an accelerated path toward greater growth and advancement of civilization, true. And like most good things, humans abuse them and overdo them and greed takes over and then you go too quickly too fast and the consequence is now we have this massive amount of debt that is unsustainable and we're not yet making the tough decisions that we will soon be forced to make otherwise the whole thing is meaning i mean money's just is not worth anything so to answer your question i hope before this Bitcoin ETF approval, in general, you had no choice. You are stuck in the currency of your country based by the US dollar, right? Backed by the US dollar as the global reserve. But let's say you now, uh, you see the impact of inflation is having on your uh, life savings and you don't see a good outcome for inflation and where the value of the US dollar is going, right? You now have a choice that is alternative to just buying gold. And by the way, gold is the world's most valuable asset class, right? It's at $13 trillion. It's the number one thing that people still own in terms of value. But now Bitcoin is basically that, just better. So, to answer your question, I guess it's like, okay, if I'm really worried about my uh, keeping my value in inflationary times, I'm not going to buy gold. I'm going to buy Bitcoin instead. I'm going to go one step further, though, because we are an investing podcast. Like if you want to preserve the value of your capital, don't buy gold or Bitcoin, like invest in the world's greatest companies and go listen to a bunch of our other episodes and go check out our content at seveninvesting.com and find out what some of those companies are. Like... If you can invest in appreciating assets, you get your money working for you rather than you working for your money. And that is literally like the secret to life in terms of creating freedom and the ability to kind of direct how you spend your own time. Um, but yeah, good wise words and interesting comments on uh, the gold to Bitcoin transition. One of my very close friends, Dunya, is a, um, a real gold advocate. I think she has literally like, I don't know if she has hordes of physical gold. Don't be trying to like root her out and like root for her basement. But she owns a ton of gold investments. So this will be the test for me if Dunya starts pivoting from gold to Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating question, Badger. I mean, really, talk about a time to be alive. You know, we talk about AI all the time and what's coming with autonomous driving and just how quickly the world is changing as though that's not enough, right? As though those revolutions are not coming quickly and fast enough. All of a sudden, we have a monetary, the whole world's, potentially, the whole world's monetary system is now also in the crossroads. Uh, and we didn't even talk, uh, begin talking about 
what blockchain technology enables and smart contracts and all of that, which all of the via chain link labs, all of the world's financial uh, banks are connecting to. So uh, stay tuned, folks, because things are getting pretty wild pretty fast. I hope you enjoyed today's bonus episode. You've been listening to Wall Street Wildlife.